So welcome to the next lecture of, um, of uh, selected topics in, in, in graph theory. Uh, during the last lecture, Martin was uh, giving you uh, a tour of the graph minor theory, so a, a theory of topological embeddings of graphs in graphs. Um, and uh, topological properties of graphs. Uh, so this will be, I think, the last lecture in this uh, in this topic. Uh, we'll be focusing now on planar graphs uh, because this will be a smooth transition to the next lectures that will be about colorings of planar graphs. Uh, but for now, we want to uh, to look at the particular case of, uh, of of the graph minor theory in planar graphs. So as you have uh, um, probably seen uh, in the sketch of the graph minor theorem that, uh, that Martin was giving in the last lecture, um, planar graphs play a vital role in this whole theory. Uh, they are a... Um, sort of uh, important example of a uh, of a graph class that is topologically constrained and it is a important step in the proof of the graph minors uh, theorem to prove this uh, theorem for the particular case of planar graphs and a lot of um, uh, tools uh, developed for graph minors uh, they work uh, nicely in the context of planar graphs and they work in 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 this context uh, in a um, way that can be exploited for further understanding of planar graphs. So the goal of this lecture uh, today is to give you a glimpse into, in, into this. So we will be looking at a particular toolbox from the graph minor theory and apply them to the particular case of planar graphs and understand what can be done better there or what can, I, can be done simpler there. So particularly we will be looking at two uh, results um, here. This will be um, the relation between the uh, tree width of a graph and the radius of a planar graph. And second thing that we will be looking at is, uh, is the existence of grid minors. Uh, and uh, the particular case of the excluded grid minor theorem uh, in the context uh, in, in, in planar graphs. Okay, so first thing first, uh, uh, the relation between the tree width and the radius of a graph um, in planar. Uh, so, uh, just to recall, I hope that most of you have already seen the radius of a graph or can imagine what is the radius of a graph. So, if G is a connected graph, um, then I say that it has radius at most R if I can find the vertex U in this graph so that every other vertex V is a distance at most R from U. Yeah, so I can find such a center vertex um, such that uh, every other vertex is not that far from it. Yeah, so uh, more formally uh, put into, in, into letters, uh, the radius of a graph is uh, I take all possible vertices u and for each of them I calculate what is the maximum possible distance to some other vertex of a graph and then I take the best possible uh, center so I minimize over all the vertices. Yeah, so this is the, the radius of a graph. And uh, the intuition is that, uh, uh, well, if, if a graph has small radius, it is sort of packed in a sense, not necessarily, right? Because a clique, for instance, has very small radius, but this is, it is a dense graph. But what we will show in a moment uh, is that in planar graphs, there is a, a functional relation between the, the true width and the radius uh, of a graph. So I claim that if, if, if G is a uh, actually connected planar graph, uh, for the radius to make sense, then the true width of G is bounded by three times the radius. Um, so many of you have already seen this proof uh, during the parameterless algorithm course, but uh, it is an important fact about uh, a true width in planar graphs. So uh, we will repeat this, this uh, uh, today for those of you who haven't seen it before. And the intuition behind uh, 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 this, this theorem is kind of simple. So imagine that you've got this, uh, this, this planar graph G and you've got the center vertex U, yes? And you know that the radius is, is, is small. So the intuition is that if you say, um, play Cops and Trover game uh, in, in this graph, uh, the natural idea would be to place the Cops on some radius of a graph yeah, so uh, on the path from U to say the, 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 the furthest vertex and maybe another two R cops on another radius and then keep those cops intact, yeah, always at the same place while the other cops are doing like a sweep, a, an angular sweep around, around this, uh, um, this graph, always keeping, uh, keeping a, um, uh, a, a keeping uh, being on 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 a path uh, on a radial path in this graph, and in this way, the area in which the 
uh, the rover can be is, is getting shrunk, 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 shrunk up to the moment when uh, the rover is caught by the uh, corpse. So this is a actually a very bad intuition in a sense, meaning uh, it, it doesn't need to look like that uh, in, in fact. Um, however, as a very basic intuition, why this kind of a relation should be sort of true, uh, this, this can serve as, uh, as, as, as a base, uh, base idea. Good, okay, so we are going to do, to do the proof. So first of all, um, we will assume that the graph G is triangulate. Uh, why so? Well, uh, by triangulate, I mean that I take every face and I just add some additional uh, edges into this face so that every uh, uh, face I obtain in this manner is a triangle. Um, so this uh, can be done because adding uh, new edges to the graph can only increase the tree width and decrease the radius. Yeah, so that the left hand side only can go up and the right hand side can only go down. So the, uh, the inequality becomes uh, uh, only sharp. Good, so now the graph is triangulate. Um, so what we know about the graph, we know that there is a vertex U, yes, in this graph. Yes, yeah, so that every other vertex is a distance that moves R from. Yeah, so this is uh, the central vertex. And let me uh, take uh, any tree of a BFS of a breadth first search starting from U. So this is a tree of depth uh, at most R. So let's see how this uh, situation looks like. Yeah, this is not necessarily a, a BFS tree, but uh, let's say close to a BFS tree. So here is the central vertex U. Uh, and now uh, in the solid uh, blue, I have drawn the, the BFS tree uh, from you. This is a tree of bounded depth. Yeah, and all the other faces, these are these faces with, um, uh, that um, have edges both from the tree T and from outside of the treaty, uh, all the other faces are triangles. Uh, I have not uh, drawn all the faces as triangles, observe that the outer face is actually not a triangle. You can imagine that it's also triangulated outside. Uh, I just did not uh, um, draw it because the picture would be completely messy. So now the idea is to look at the uh, something called the co-tree of, uh, of the treaty. So what is a co-tree? So the co-tree here is uh, is depicted in the in orange in the in this picture, and so the vertices of this code tree are the faces of the graph. So for every face of the graph, I draw a vertex inside it, sort of. Yeah. So these are those uh, those orange vertices inside the faces, and now I draw the edges uh, of my code tree as these are duals of the edges um, uh, of the edges that are not in T. So what does it mean? Whenever I have two faces of the graph that are connected, uh, that are together incident, uh, that they neighbor through an edge that is not in the tree T, then I connect it by an edge uh, in the tree, in the code tree S. Yeah, so this looks like that uh, as, uh, as in the picture. Note that actually I did not draw this whole uh, code tree S because well, uh, there is this triangulated face outside. Um, but if I uh, recall that, for example, here, there is a triangular face, then actually what would happen, these two edges would converge here in another vertex, yes? That would be adjacent again to something outside. And then if there was another triangle like that, for instance, then um, this thing would be connected to this and here would be, and so on. So this triangulation of, of the outer face actually connects all of these loose endpoints into, uh, in, into a connected thing, yeah? So you can see sort of from the picture that uh, this code tree S is actually something, uh, a graph that is non-crossing with the tree T. Yeah, they are somehow interleaved in the plane. Um, it seems to be that uh, this code tree is indeed a tree, but well, this, this requires a, a, formal, a formal check. Yeah? Uh, so now uh, the fact is that if you draw this, uh, this graph S like that, uh, then it is indeed a tree. So what does it mean that it must be a tree? It must be first, it must be connected. Yes. And second, uh, it must be a tree. It has to be a site. Okay, so why this S is, is, is connected? Uh, so to see that S is connected, uh, it is uh, good to look at the tree T first. Yeah. And imagine that I now draw a, uh, an Euler tour of, of, the, of, the, of the tree T. So in a sense, I draw like a curve around this tree T that is following the, the edges of T very close, like that. So this is this, uh, this uh, violet curve that I'm now drawing. Yeah, so this 
this, uh, this curve is going around the whole treaty and so on and so on. So this curve is very close to the, um, to the treaty, but it travels through the consecutive phases and observe that it visits every phase. Yeah, because every phase is incident to some vertex of T because T is a spanning tree. Uh, and moreover, whenever I visit two consecutive phases uh, in this, in, uh, by this, uh, by this uh, violet curve, uh, this Euler tour, then these two, every two consecutive phases visited are actually connected in the tree S. Yeah, because I travel from one to the other through an edge that is not in S, right? So this means that I have found a walk, yes, along the faces, yes, that visits every face, yes, and does not cross the tree T, yes? It is a walk in the, in the tree S, uh, actually, yeah? So the graph S, the graph S uh, has a walk that visits uh, all its vertices, so it must be connected. So we have proved that uh, the code tree is, is indeed connected. So now to see, to see that it is, uh, it is indeed a tree, uh, we will just calculate uh, how many edges and how many vertices there are in, in, in the graph S. Yeah? So how many vertices there are? Well, then as many as the number of faces of G. Yeah? That, that was the definition of the vertex of S. Yeah? And how many edges does S have? Well, uh, I've got one edge per every uh, edge of the original graph. Yeah, so the number of edges of G, and I removed uh, the, all the jewels of the edges uh, of the of the tree T. Yeah, so this is uh, the vertex set of, 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 of the edge set of G minus the size of the edge set of T. Yeah? So now, how many uh, edges does uh, uh, T have? Well, the number of vertices minus one because the tree has one less edge than uh, than vertices uh, than, 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 than vertices. Um, and uh, well, the number of vertices of T is the same as the number of vertices of G, yeah, because this is, T was a spanning tree of G, right? So then the number of edges of S is equal to the number of edges of G minus the number of vertices of G plus one. But now from Euler's formula, we know that this is nothing else than the number than the number of faces of G minus two. Yeah. So this is equal to the number of faces of G minus one, right? So what we see now, S is a connected graph with one more vertex than the number of edges. So it must be a tree, yeah? A connected graph that has a one more vertex than the number of edges is always a tree. Good, so now we know, we have proved in this, in this fact that uh, this code tree uh, is in the tree. Uh, it is a, a spanning tree of the dual of, uh, of, of the graph. Um, so now based on this, uh, of this, uh, on this uh, uh, tree S, we can uh, make a tree decomposition of the graph. Yeah? Uh, so the underlying tree of the decomposition will be our co-tree S. Yeah? So on this picture, actually this orange tree S will form a shape of the decomposition of my, of my graph G. Uh, and now we need to uh, the, design what will be the backs of the of the uh, of this uh, of this decomposition. So for every node of S and vertex of S is actually a face of G, yes. So a face say X Y Z. I construct a bag consisting of vertices of three paths. Yeah. So if I have uh, three vertices X Y Z. Yes, then I take the path from X to U, the path from Y to U, and the path from Z to U, and these are paths in my tree T. Good, so let's see this on the picture. Oh, sorry. So let's uh, take some interesting phase in, 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 in our graph. Let's say that this thin phase here. Yes. So say that this is x, uh, sorry, this is x, this vertex, this is y, and this is z. Yeah, so th this is a phase, yes, with uh, three vertices x, y, z. So with this phase, I associate a bag consisting of this path, this path, and this path. So the union of the, verte uh, of the vertex set of those three paths. Right? Good, so how large is this bag? Well, 
Uh, each of those parts contains vertex u, so this is one vertex. And apart from vertex u, because of the tree t having depth at most r, it contains at most r other vertices. Yeah. So the size of the bag is at most one for the vertex u plus r for the first path, r for the second path, and r for the third path. So three r plus one in total. Yeah. So all the bags we have contracted in this way have a width. Uh, have at most three r plus one vertices. So the width of the decomposition of the tree decomposition that we obtain in this manner is at most three times r. Good. Uh, so uh, the key check that we are still uh, 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 that we still need to do is, is 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 to make sure that this is indeed a tree decomposition uh, of the graph. Yes, of the of the original graph G. Yeah. Uh, so what were the um, what were the properties of the 3D composition? First of all, every edge must be contained in some bag uh, of the 3D composition. Uh, but well, every edge of the graph is contained in some face. Yes, it's neighboring uh, actually two of two faces. Yes, and uh, then uh, this edge, both of the endpoints of this edge, will be explicitly included in the bag of this uh, uh, associated with this face. Okay, so every edge is uh, is uh, is indeed covered. Uh, the other uh, um, the other uh, property of a three decomposition that we need to check is that whenever I take a vertex of G, yes, and I look at all the nodes of the decomposition whose backs contain X, they need to form a connected subgraph, a connected subgraph of the decomposition. Okay, so let's take uh, some vertex X of the of the graph G here. Say that this vertex X. And let's think in which uh, bags uh, of the tree decomposition uh, as beta that we constructed, uh, this vertex X, X is contained. Well, X is contained in all the uh, bags associated with faces that are incident to at least one vertex of this subtree that is hanging uh, below X. Yeah, because it is, uh, X is contained in all the bags uh, whenever this one of those three paths from the endpoint of the triangle to you was containing vertex x. Yeah, so these are exactly the paths that are rooted in the vertex of the subtree below x. Yeah, so for instance, uh, this uh, this triangle its back will contain x, and this triangle's back will contain x, and this triangle is as well, and also this triangle, and this triangle, and maybe this triangle, and so on and so on. So all the triangles incident to to this subtree, right? So now we need to make sure that these uh, that these uh, faces uh, um, incident to the subtree are in fact connected in the tree decomposition in, in this in this uh, code tree S, right? Because this is this is the condition. But now we can make the same trick that we did before. So imagine that I make an Euler tour of my subtree T X subtree hanging below X. So I draw a curve that is going around the subtree very closely. So this, this curve induces a walk in, in, in the tree S. Yeah? So the, every two consecutive uh, faces uh, visited by this curve uh, are, are adjacent to each other uh, in the tree S. Yes? And it visits all the faces that are incident to this uh, tree TX. Right? So this, this walk uh, proves that, uh, that the set of faces incident to, to Tx is, is connected in S. Good. So this was the uh, check that uh, our decomposition S beta is indeed a tree decomposition of the original graph G. And in fact, uh, this sort of uh, coincides with our intuition uh, that we had uh, at the beginning that uh, the the backs of the three decomposition will be sort of radial paths and will sweep this uh, area around vertex u uh, radially. It's just that we keep three radii at the time uh, rather than two, as our intuition was suggesting to us. Good. So this was this proof uh, of the bound between the, the radius and the, uh, and the uh, tree of a planar graph. Maybe you can put some plus ones in the chat uh, if, if you are happy with this proof. And if you are not happy with this proof, uh, please feel free to ask a question.
Okay, I see some number of, of, of plus ones. Uh, not everybody. Are there any questions? Okay. I have I another guess. stupid question. What, what exactly was the thesis? Uh, ah, the, what, 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 we, what were we proving uh, yes. from the beginning? Yes, we were proving that if G is a planar graph, or maybe I will go up simply. Yeah, we were proving this theorem. Okay. If G is a connected planar graph, then the truth is at most three times radius. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what we did, true. we uh, we proved it by exposing a by constructing explicitly a three decomposition of with three times radius. I was curious, is this a tie span? Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the question. Can you repeat? Is this a tight bound? Do you know planar graphs that have exactly tight bound? Uh, that's a good question. It depends what does it mean tight. Um, the right notion of tight here would be uh, is uh, is it true that for every hour I can construct a graph with uh, true if at exactly three hour, three hour? I am not sure. I I would bet yes, but uh, but I am not sure. Yeah. Good. That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Good. So um, if there are no more questions, we can uh, uh, move to the highlight of today's lecture. Namely, what happens with excluded grids in planar graphs? So recall that one of the cornerstones of uh, the graph minor theory was this uh, relation between uh, excluded grids, uh, between grid minors, and the true for the graph. Yeah, so there was this, uh, the, this, this, this major theorem uh, proved by Robertson and Seymour uh, that uh, there is a functional dependence between the two. So in particular, there is a function f such that uh, whenever you have a graph G, yes, uh, and the truth is, is very large, larger than f of k, yes, then actually G must contain a k times k grid minor. So in particular, this theorem tells you that uh, the only reason why a graph is not looking like a tree, a tree of with k, so has a tree of at most k, uh, f, sorry, f of k, is because it has a large bidimensional structure in that. In, in the form of a k times k grid minor. Yeah, so this is a conceptually a very important result here. Uh, and in general graphs, uh, the, the, the first proof of this theorem gave a very bad bound on F. Uh, we have seen during, I think, the third or the fourth lecture um, that uh, a proof giving a bound F of k, I think Martin showed you a proof with uh, some exponential dependence on, um, on k, I guess two to the poly k was was there. Uh, the best known bound is 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 polynomial in in k, so it's actually actually uh, roughly k to nineteen uh, currently. It was a big uh, open problem for many years, and it was resolved uh, in two thousand twelve, I think, uh, that uh, the bound is polynomial. But there is a lower bound uh, that this function f must be at least k squared of k. Yeah, so you cannot hope for a polynomial uh, for a linear. However, if you restrict attention to some graph classes like planar graphs, then actually you can prove a much better bound uh, on the exclusive grid minor theorem. Namely, we will show during this lecture that uh, in planar graphs you can prove that if the tree width is, uh, uh, is linear, is at least linear in k, then actually you can find the k times k grid minor. So the best bound I know is, I think, 9 over 2 here, the constant. We will give uh, a slightly uh, a more relaxed proof for uh, c equal to five. So I will show that if the truth of g is larger than five times k, then I can expose a k times k grid minor in 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 our graph, uh, and the proof will be significantly different uh, uh, from what Martin was doing uh, to prove uh, the grid uh, the excluded grid minor theorem in general graphs. It will very highly exploit the the structure of planar graphs, and it will also show some. Um, some nice uh, properties of truth in planar graphs as well. Good. So this is what uh, we'll be doing for the for the rest of the lecture. Uh, but before we actually do it, uh, we need to develop some tools to to to, to understand uh, uh, the objects we'll be working with. 
Uh, so I will be working a lot with uh, with uh, topological embeddings of of, of, of of planar graphs. So I will usually assume that G is a plane graph, so a graph embedded in the plane. Yeah? And if I have a graph embedded uh, in the plane together with an embedding, and then I can think about uh, curves in the in this in this embedding, and particularly uh, an object that we will be looking at will be phase vertex curve. So phase, a first phase vertex curve in a um, in a in a planar graph in a plane graph is a curve that uh, looks like that. It is non self crossing, yeah. So it just uh, goes somewhere in the plane. It can start say at some vertex or maybe in some phase and it can end at some vertex in some phase. But uh, the rule is that it can intersect um, uh, the graph itself only at vertices. Yeah. So here, this uh, curve starts at this vertex, then goes, uh, jumps to this vertex, then jumps to this vertex, and so on. But uh, it alternately travels through vertices of the graph and through faces. It never crosses an edge in the middle. But observe that whenever it crosses a vertex, it can jump, for example, from this face to a face that is uh, neighboring only through this vertex. Yeah. So I can jump actually uh, uh, quite far, uh, uh, in a sense, in this way. Good. So this is a phase vertex curve. So this is a basic notion of uh, like a topological separator in a planar graph. And the noose uh, is a closed phase vertex curve. Yeah. So here on this picture, you see an example of a noose. Uh, so I alternately travel through phases and through vertices of the graph, and I start and end at the same vertex. Yeah. And this must be a non-self-crossing. Uh, uh, curve. So by Jordan's theorem, um, all the topological details uh, swept under the carpet, uh, this news partitions the, the plane into two regions. The region uh, inside the, um, the curve that is enclosed by the curve and the region outside it. Okay. So this is this blue and yellow region. Uh, uh, respectively. So now I can, uh, given such a uh, such a noose, I can partition my graph into the inside and the outside. So the inside will consist of all the vertices and edges that are embedded inside the curve in the region enclosed by the curve. Topologically, it is a disk. Yes, uh, both inside and on the boundary. Yes, so all these vertices and edges that I now draw in red, they will uh, be in the Subgraph enclosed by the curve, by the inside, uh, in the inside of the curve. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, this this should not be red. Uh, and there, there is another subgraph that is outside. Yeah, so these are all these uh, vertices and edges. Yeah, that uh, are outside or on the boundary. Yeah, so the intersection of the inside and the outside is actually exactly consisting of the vertices of the graph that are visited by the by the curve. So this is the vertex set intersection with gamma. Good. So we now understand that the noose actually partitions a graph. So you can think of a noose as a separator in a plane. So the idea is uh, uh, for, uh, for the proof will be similar to this uh, uh, proof that we have seen, I think, on the second lecture of the uh, approximation algorithm for true with uh, the one that uh, was exposing a well-linked set. Namely, we will decompose the graph recursively. Yeah, so every time we will uh, be looking at some piece of the graph and we will try to break it further using some separator and uh, into smaller and smaller pieces. And in this way, the tree of this recursion will naturally form a tree decomposition of the graph. Yeah. So uh, the state of the recursion uh, in the proof yes, will, um, will be given by a noose. So at every point, I will have a noose gamma that encloses some part of the graph, some subgraph. Uh, and this noose should be short in the sense that it will pass through at most 4k vertices. Yeah. Uh, and what the recursion step should do, the outcome of the recursion step is, should be either I am able to decompose the subgraph here. Yeah? So I am able to produce a tree decomposition of the inside uh, of the subgraph induced by the inside of, the, of, the, of this curve uh, with all these vertices on the boundary in the top back. Yeah, so this is the usual condition that will allow us to, to glue this tree decomposition to, to, um, to something uh, from, from, from the previous level. And the width should be at most 5k, as, as, uh, as, as expected. 
Yeah. So this is one possible outcome. Uh, the other possible outcome is that I, actually the algorithm fails to produce such a decomposition. And in case it fails to produce such a decomposition, it should produce a K times K grid map. Yeah. So if I make such, a, uh, such an algorithm um, that uh, produces one of those two outcomes, then I will actually prove my theorem. Because assuming um, the graph has truth larger than 5K, yeah? Um, the first outcome cannot be possible because I cannot compute a three decomposition of with at most 5k of the graph. So the second outcome must be uh, must be the must be the one reported, and the second outcome is the is the grid minor that uh, that I was looking for. So whenever the truth will be too large, actually the algorithm will produce uh, a grid minor. Yeah, so the uh, the proof of the theorem will actually come together with a polynomial time algorithm to uh, to distinguish these two cases. Okay, so uh, first of all, because I already jumped a little bit ahead, uh, because I said that I um, decompose my graph G, uh, and I said that uh, I can run my uh, algorithm on the graph G, I need to start uh, the recursion somewhere. Yes. Um, so the recursion can start with uh, looking at the outer face uh, of the graph, or maybe there are some vertices here as well. Uh, this face is at least a triangle. I can assume, of course, that the graph is simple, so there are no uh, faces of length two. And I can uh, pro start with any uh, news that uh, just travels like this, say it uh, visits three or maybe even more uh, vertices on this outer face, and then the whole graph G is inside. Yeah, so the uh, application of this uh, of this recursion to my uh, to this uh, initial situation um, will uh, will either find a, a, a grid minor in the graph or will find a three decomposition. So now we are. Uh, uh, we need to make the recursion step. But maybe before we make a, uh, uh, we delve into the recursion step, there are some questions maybe regarding the setup and uh, and uh, uh, what we are doing now. Okay, maybe some plus ones. Okay, very good. I see a number of plus ones, so so we continue. Good. So the recursion step is as follows. Uh, we've got uh, um, our curve gamma, our news gamma, and we've got the graph H that is uh, the graph that is inside the uh, the curve gamma, and we've got this uh, x. These are the vertices that are on the boundary of the disk, and the the, the curve gamma encloses a disk. And we are thinking about the subgraph and embedded into this disk. Yeah, and the boundary is the set X, uh, which is of size at most 4K. This is the, uh, the recursion variant that we are having. I will work now under the assumption that actually set X is of size exactly 4K. I will, uh, we will later fix this uh, in a sense that uh, we will uh, reduce the journal case to the case where actually the boundary is of size exactly 4K. So for now, think that the boundary is, uh, this is sort of, there, there is an intuition that this is a, a general case in, in a sense, yes, that the boundary is, uh, is the largest possible. So now, now comes the main trick of the proof. So if the boundary is of size exactly 4K, I can partition the boundary into four arcs. I will call them north, south, east, west. Yeah. Each of them is of size K. Yeah, so now we have uh, nicely laid out our disk into sort of a square. You can think of it as, as a square. And uh, uh, it has four boundaries, uh, north, uh, west, uh, south, east. Um, and we can start to play with this boundary. Uh, so we play as follows. I, let me think how many west, east paths, how many disjoint west, east paths uh, uh, we can find. And there are two possibilities. Either I can find k vertex disjoint west east path, so looking like that. And know that if they are disjoint, uh, they cannot cross. So in the because they are embedded in this into this disk, they need to be really um, connecting the first uh, uh, vertex from the west with the first vertex from the east, the second with the second, and so on and so on. Because uh, otherwise they would cross within this disk. Yeah. So either I can find k of them, and I cannot find more than k because I have k vertices on the west and k vertices on the east. Yeah. Or I can find less, only less than k. 
Yeah, so these are two possibilities. But if I find less than k, then by Menger's theorem, I know that uh, there is a separator uh, between uh, east and west that is uh, of size smaller than k. Yeah, so in other words, I can find here less than k vertices um, that uh, intersect every path going from west to east. Yeah. Good, so the intuition now is that because we are working in a planar graph, um, this, this separator cannot be completely random. It cannot be completely random, uh, a vertex here, a vertex there, and so on. This uh, separator should somehow respect the topology. Or in other words, if, if, if this is a separator and I look at the region that is reachable from west, uh, blocked by this separator, then sort of uh, you see topologically the boundary of this region somehow. Yeah. So th the intuition is that this separator should somehow respect the topology. And we already have a tool to say what does it mean respect the topology. Uh, namely, later we will prove a lemma uh, saying that this, uh, this separator respects the topology in the following sense, that there is a phase vertex curve connecting north with the south. Yes, and crossing at most k vert, uh, uh, crossing at most k vert. Yeah. So this uh, the separator from Menger's theorem actually has a nice uh, topological interpretation. It is like a boundary crossing uh, phase vertex curve crossing uh, uh, less than k vertices, and of course then it is a uh, it is sort of a blocker for all the paths from west to east because every west to east path needs to cross uh, one of those. Yeah. So this is a basic uh, flow cut duality theorem for planar graphs that explains that the separators are topologically uh, well understood. We will later prove this theorem. Uh, so I hope that uh, you can uh, intuitively believe it at this point uh, and later we'll patch the proof of this one. Good. So now we, we, we take it as promised. And based on this, if we are able to find such a phase vertex curve, yes, that crosses less than k vertices, then I claim that I can make a recursion, that I can do a recursion step. Namely, if I have now this curve going through the separator, call it uh, delta, yes, then I can uh, break my graph H into two subgraphs, H1 and H2. This is the subgraph what is to the left of the, cur of the, of the curve delta and what is to the right. So now what I can do is uh, that in H1, I uh, apply my algorithm recursively and compute some tree decomposition uh, of H1 that has all these vertices uh, on the boundary of H1 in the top back, similarly for H2. Yeah, so this black vertices are the vertices on the boundary of H2, yes. And then I can combine these two, two tree decompositions um, into a tree decomposition of the whole graph H, yes by uh, putting one root back that consists of all these vertices uh, depicted on this picture. So all the vertices on the boundary of H together with all the vertices of that. And now uh, how many vertices there are in total here? There are at most 4K from the uh, boundary of H and at most K minus one from the vertices that are traversed by delta. Yeah, so this is at most 5K in top. Uh, good, so there's one thing that I swept under the carpet that is actually really important, uh, namely that uh, when I'm doing this recursion and this recursion, I need to make sure that the boundary of H1, yes, consists of at most 4K vertices because this was my uh, recursion assumption, uh, my invariant, yeah? And now comes the trick. In H1, observe that I've lost all the vertices from the east. Here are k vertices from the east that are not present at all in H1. I replaced them with vertices of delta. Yeah. So still, because I lost all those vertices and gained at most k minus one new vertices, I actually have that the boundary of H1 is still bound by 4k. And the same for H2. Also, you need to know that actually H1 and H2 are smaller graphs than H. And this is because uh, delta actually has at most 4k minus one vertices, 
So I cannot uh, have all the vertices. For, uh, I, I, meaning uh, this needs to be, in fact, a smaller graph because at least one vertex from the from the east is 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 uh, is lost. Okay, so this actually brings us to something that uh, that I omitted in this uh, in this exposition, namely that there is a uh, a caveat um, that uh, this curve gamma connecting north with south. Yes. Uh, I did not tell that uh, it cannot uh, actually touch the west and the east, and it can. The situation can be like like here that it will uh, some of those vertices that are visited by uh, by the curve uh, uh, delta uh, are actually on the east and west. Yeah, and then H1 and H2 are not really graphs that are bounded by a, by a simple noose. Yeah, because this noose uh, sort of touches itself uh, back here. Yeah, at this vertex. But then uh, this is actually not, not a problem because now if, if I have this new delta, then instead of uh, breaking the graph into H1 and H2, yes, I break it into possibly more pieces. This is one piece, this is one piece, this is one piece, and so on. Yeah, and uh, I recurse on all these pieces separately and join them here uh, below this back, the, the obtained tree decomposition. And again, because each of the pieces is either on the left of the curve delta or on the right of the curve delta, yes, then each of the pieces uh, loses either east or west, or rather either east or west is replaced by delta. So still each of the pieces will have a boundary of size 4k and the recursion can be obtained. Good. Uh, maybe any uh, questions regarding uh, the recursion step when uh, when I have a uh, a separator uh, between east and west. Okay. If not, then uh, I have a question. Yes? How do we combine these multiple regions in this caveat uh, situation when they all have 4k? We cannot just put them into one bag because it will be have more than 5k. Uh, well, what you do, you make one root bag, yeah, consisting of all the vertices of gamma and of delta. Yeah, so all these vertices here depicted in, in black. There is still at most 5k of them. Yeah, because on on gamma there are four k vertices and on delta there are at most k k minus one vertices. Yeah, and then uh, for each of those uh, uh, those those regions here, yes, you apply recursion, getting a different tree decomposition. Of the, of the stuff uh, uh, from the region, and you uh, put them as children of the of of this root back of size five k five k. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. In a sense, even though I have many, many regions here, um, it is still the case that, uh, that this root back consisting of gamma and delta consists of 5k vertices. Good. Uh, good. Any further questions? Good. Um, if not, then maybe we can continue. Um, okay, so obviously uh, I can do this the same argument as symmetric way. Yeah, if if I have if I now calculate the flow from north to south, and uh, it turns out that I have less than uh, k paths going from uh, north to south, um, then I can uh, do the recursion. Uh, I, I can proceed with a recursive step the same way. I I find the west east. Uh, curve that uh, crosses only less than k vertices, and I can now divide the, um, my disk into the upper half and the lower half, and the recurrence there. So now we are left with the case. What happens if I have both an east-west flow of size k and a north-south uh, flow of size k? Okay, so let's draw it. Um, okay, so I've got uh, horizontal paths from east to west carry of them like that. And I've got also paths going from north to south, looking like that. Yeah, okay. So 
the picture sort of suggests that we are on a good track, right? Um, this uh, should be sort of a grid miner uh, already. Uh, if we if we see flows in both large flows in both directions, uh, not exactly. You need to be careful here, uh, because what uh, what can happen is that maybe maybe this flow is is looking like that, but maybe this path going north south are doing more crazy stuff. They are still disjoint with each other, but they can. Uh, uh, they can oscillate around those paths from, from west to east. And this structure, even though I drew it uh, in, the first, uh, in the first picture as a, as a nice uh, grid-like structure, but uh, it is not necessarily the case that any uh, east-west uh, flow and any north-south flow, both of sides K, in fact give you a K times K grid mine. Yeah. So you need to be careful with this argument, but you can do it. In a sense, we will prove uh, next lemma. Yes, uh, showing that if you have a large flow east uh, west and a large flow north south, then actually you can find a k times k grid minor. You can sort of clean this situation uh, to get a, a k times k grid minor. Good. Uh, good. So this is the intuition. So uh, there are three things that uh, we have not uh, seen so far uh, that we need to patch. Uh, first thing is this cleaning the, the flows in order to get a grid. Second is the proof of this uh, flow cut duality lemma. So uh, the fact that uh, if I have a, uh, a small separator separating east from west, then actually the separator can be expressed as a, as a phase vertex curve uh, connecting north to with south. And we need to pass this uh, assumption that I got, uh, got in the first place that, uh, um, that the boundaries of size equality for K. Uh, good, so let's do this. Uh, yeah, maybe some questions at this point, or maybe also plus ones if there are no questions uh, yeah, to keep me happy that, uh, that you are still on board. Okay, any doubts? Because I do not see that many uh, plus ones. Should I repeat something? Okay, if, if, if not, then, uh, then let's continue. And now we are uh, going to, to patch the, uh, the different things that we left from the proof. Uh, so first I will, I will start with the easier ones. Uh, let's first patch this production to the case where X is of size uh, 4K. Okay, so imagine that X is actually smaller. Yeah, the boundary is of size smaller than K. So there are a few corner cases that I want to get rid of uh, at the beginning. So first of all, there is a corner case. Let's look at the faces uh, of this graph embedded into this into this disk. And let's imagine that, um, let's look at those arcs. Arcs between the consecutive vertices of X on the boundary. So first it may happen that for instance, two of those arcs, say this one, and this one are actually on the same face of this graph inside. Uh, this, this would mean that this, uh, uh, sorry, that this graph inside must be disconnected actually. Yeah. So the situation may look like this and uh, there is a face of the stuff inside that, bound, that uh, uh, is, is adjacent to two arcs of the bound. Then actually this is perfect because we can now make a recursion step dissolving our gamma into two curves, gamma one and gamma two looking like that. So this will be one part of the recursion and this would be second part of the recursion. Yeah, so similar as we did uh, before a, um, a recursion into several areas in, in, inside, this, uh, inside this square, then now I can simply recurse into, into this side and this side into gamma one and gamma two, get the decompositions there and glue them together uh, under one back consisting of the whole of X. Yep. So this is not a problem and I can do this because there are no edges between the uh, gamma one, uh, between, between the two regions. Good, so this was an easy case, yeah. Uh, another easy case would be if uh, what happens if uh, I actually have uh, two vertices on the boundary. Maybe I can now draw some more vertices inside. 
uh, two vertices on the boundary that are actually adjacent. Yeah, so for instance, this vertex and this vertex, they are adjacent. I can do a similar trick. I can now make uh, a curve, say gamma, that is following closely this one edge between the two guys on the boundary. Yeah? And now I can split my boundary into this side and this side. Yeah? So this is like a cut of size two in this graph embedded into the disk. So again, we can uh, uh, we can recurse on the left side and on the right side, get the three decompositions there, and glue them together uh, under a bag consisting of the whole bundle. Good. Note that this case also applies if I have two consecutive guys, yeah, connected by an edge. And in this case, what would happen? I would draw a curve here on this side of this edge, yes, between these two vertices. This is a phase vertex curve, and I would chip away a very small graph here, consisting only of two parts and one edge, and then uh, I would recurse on the rest of the graph being this curve looking like that. Yeah, And again, uh, I would recurse into a slightly smaller graph that uh, lost one edge, and one very simple graph with one edge uh, only. And for this graph, I, can, uh, I will not actually recurse anymore. I will uh, produce a single back tree decomposition consisting of these two words. Good, so we have uh, uh, now resolved these two corner cases whenever I've got uh, two arcs on the same face and whenever I have two verts on the bar that are, uh, that are adjacent, then I can do uh, some, some easy recursion stuff. Uh, so imagine now that uh, we have the, the remaining situation. So I have a uh, situation one and two do not have. Yeah, so let's draw it again. Here are the, have those verts on the boundary. And let's look at one arc between two consecutive guys. Yeah. So this arc is incident to some phase of this graph. Yeah. Here is this phase. So observe that this phase needs to contain some vertices other than these two endpoints. Because if it contained only these two endpoints, it would be just an edge between those two endpoints. And then case two would apply. Yeah. So there are some more vertices here. And the next vertex on this, uh, the one after this, say, vertex x, say this vertex z, it cannot be also another uh, vertex of the boundary because, again, case two would apply. So what now I can do, I can modify my curve gamma by doing something like that. I can just artificially add vertex z to the boundary. Yeah? And now I can recurse on, on my new gamma prime Yes, and this this recursion uh, will be actually stronger because uh, because I artificially input one more versus the boundary. So in my recursion step, I I ask for more. I ask for more vertices to be in the top back. So this is not a problem. Good. So unless these two corner cases apply, I can actually artificially add one vertex to the boundary and, 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 and just pretend that this vertex is also there. Yeah. And I can do it up till the moment where x is of size exactly 4k. Okay, this was, this was a technical corner, uh, 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 this was a technical fix. I hope that you see that this can be done. Uh, the details are not uh, that, that important. Good. So now we go to the to the uh, to the more interesting stuff, namely flow cut duality. So recall that uh, that the flow cut duality lemma that we will need to prove now is uh, a lemma saying that if I have a uh, small flow, uh, if I have a uh, um, do not have a flow of size k between uh, west and east, then I have a, a phase vertex curve um, delta connecting north and south that passes through less than k vertices. Good, so by Menger's theorem, I know that there is a separator. There is a set of vertices, call it z, of size smaller than k that intersects all the west-east paths. So now what we would like to, to, to really do is we would like to find a curve connecting north and south that passes only through the vertices of z. Yeah, because then this curve will pass through at less than k vertices because k, z has less than k vertices in total. Uh, good. So now we want to 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 find this curve. So let's uh, let's do it like that. Um, first, we will color the vertices. First of all, I will color green or color west plus. 
all the vertices of my graph that are reachable from west by paths that avoid that. So I, what, whatever I can uh, reach uh, from, from the west, not passing through the vertices of z, yes, uh, this, this, this becomes of color uh, west plus. So east plus will be all the remaining vertices apart from z. Yeah, so this will be east plus. This is west plus. Okay, so so far I have colored uh, uh, all the vertices apart from z. And now uh, suppose that I do not have a phase vertex uh, uh, curve connecting north and south. And then I can also connect, uh, color the vertices of z as follows. I co uh, color north plus all the vertices of z that can be reached from the north by a, first, by a phase vertex curve. Yes. And south plus, yes, will be all the remaining vertices, uh, vertices of, uh, of, of s. Good. So uh, I think I need to artificially also say that. Uh, that the vertices of S, um, that here, like this, this areas are also uh, are also colored north and south. Good. Okay, uh, we'll we'll fix it in in a moment. Good. So what do we have now? Uh, we we now know that uh, there are no two vertices uh, colored uh, west plus and east plus that are adjacent. Well, because so well, uh, west plus was defined as something reachable from west. So if if I had something east plus neighboring something from west plus. Um, adjacent, then this, this guy from east plus should be also west plus. Yeah? And also the vertices of north plus and of south plus cannot lie on one face, right? Because, uh, um, because, uh, uh, well, because uh, for the same reason, if I had the north plus vertex here, and the south plus vertex here, then actually this north plus could reach by a first vertex curve also this south plus, yes, because I could just extend this curve here. Yes, uh, this would uh, mean that this vertex from south plus should be also in north plus. Uh, good. So we have now this coloring. Uh, and uh, um, uh, what I now, now uh, can see is that, uh, okay, my graph is uh, not yet triangulated. I would like to now triangulate it. And I uh, claim that I can triangulate it so that uh, uh, the vertices from west plus and east plus uh, uh, still are uh, non-adjacent. And this can be easily seen. Whenever I have a face and say that there are some north plus vertices here, yes, and there are some east plus and uh, west plus, then I can first triangulate the, the north uh, plus vertices, yes, and then every remaining region is, is, is having only the east plus or the west plus, and then I can triangulate it, it, it in, in any way. Yeah. So I'm saying uh, I triangulate the graph uh, in such a way that uh, still I do not have west plus and east plus uh, adjacent. Yeah. So uh, now we have the following situation. We have a triangulated plane graph. Yes. Um, yes, and it is colored with four colors, yes, and uh, now I think I messed up something. Uh, I don't want to fix it now, but let's assume uh, for, for, for now that each of those colors is forming uh, an arc on the outer face. So definitely this is true for um, west and east, yes, here are uh, the colors, uh, the guys from west are colored west plus, and the guys from east are colored east plus. Um, and now you can uh, also see that actually, yeah, this should be also true that uh, there are some vertices uh, on the boundary that are colored uh, south plus, and there are some vertices on the boundary colored north plus, and they are they are there here. Yeah, um, because even if uh, all of those vertices are colored uh, north plus, uh, are colored either west or east, then actually there must be some vertex z that, that is uh, here on the face uh, incident to the, to the northern side of the boundary. And because otherwise you would see a path avoiding z. Uh, so there must be at least one vertex uh, uh, colored north plus, 
And there must be at least one vertex colored south plus somewhere here. Yes, from, from that. Yeah. So I see here uh, the west side, the east side, uh, the south side and the north, the north side. And these are, you can think of them as, uh, as, as, as four, um, as four uh, uh, intervals on the boundary. The west and the east are fully, uh, are fully uh, west plus and the east plus. The north and south, they contain at least one vertex from north plus and at least one vertex from south plus. So now comes the trick that uh, we've got a triangle plane, plane graph with four colors. Each of them is, uh, is, is present on the outer face. And now you can apply, apply a result for Sperner's lemma to say that there must be a triangle uh, that is multicolored in the sense that it has all the three colors present at the vertex. Uh, Sperner's lemma says the following. Sperner's lemma says that if you have a, uh, if you have a plane graph uh, embedded in a disk, in such a way, and it is uh, colored with three colors, so that on this side of the uh, of the of the triangle there are only colors one and two. On this side there are only colors two and three, and on this side only colors one and three. Yes, and the vertices of this graph are colored one, uh, two, three. Then inside somewhere there, this is triangulated plane graph. Then inside uh, uh, this uh, this this triangle plane graph. There must be a vertex with all the vertices. Uh, there must be triangle with all the vertices colored with three colors. Uh, so now, how I can apply it in this situation? I can, for instance, uh, merge the colors north plus and uh, east plus. Um, in this way, obtain uh, a triangulated planar graph with all three colors uh, um, present on the boundary, and they are present in such a way that uh, uh, it should be it should be easy to see. Um, that I can divide the, the boundary into those four arcs, uh, having only colors one, two, two, three, and one, three. And therefore, there exists a three colored uh, triangle somewhere inside here. And a three colored triangle is a contradiction because it either contains somebody colored north plus and somebody colored south plus, yes, contradicting this property, or uh, somebody colored uh, west plus and somebody colored east plus, uh, contradicting this property. Okay, uh, I messed uh, this proof up a little bit uh, because I uh, uh, I was patching it uh, uh, on the fly because I forgot that I need to make sure that this north plus and south plus are indeed on the boundary. I hope that you uh, that you believe me that it can be patched, but maybe we will look uh, more closely during the tutorials next week uh, to make sure that this argument indeed holds. Good. Sorry for that. Good, but uh, is this uh, reasoning sort of clear or is it believable? Maybe some plus ones, maybe some questions. I didn't get that Sperner's lemma. Okay, so that what red is triangle you... Yeah, so mm. what is Sperner's lemma? Sperner's lemma says the following. Imagine you've got a planar graph, plane graph, um, that is free, uh, uh, whose vertices are colored with free colors. And there are three vertices on the boundary, colored one to three, yes? And the situation is that on this arc, there are only colors one, three. On this arc, there are only colors one, two. And on this arc, there are only colors two, three. Sperner's lemma says that then in this graph, there must exist a triangle, a face, uh, whose all three vertices are of different colors. This is a basic topological fact about plane numbers. We will actually uh, do a proof of Sperner's lemma during the tutorials next week. How do we go from four colors to three colors? So color one is color west plus, color two is color uh, say north plus, and color three is color east plus union south plus. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so indeed, you see that uh, there are three colors and so on. Um, what I, uh, uh, I, and I, I, I really apologize for this. What I, uh, what I messed up is that I forgot to, to check the condition that, uh, that indeed I can uh, um, break the, the bundle into those uh, three arcs so that I see only this. 
Um, and this requires a little bit of attention uh, for proving that there indeed there is a vertex uh, colored N plus and there is a vertex colored uh, cell plus. Uh, I don't want to do uh, this uh, on the fly during the lecture because this will delve into, into, into technical details. I do not have it prepared. Uh, I propose that we postpone uh, fixing this argument uh, um, to, the, to the tutorials, but I hope that you uh, can believe me that uh, the, the boundary can be now, um, can be now um, divided into three pieces so that I can apply a Spurner's lemma and derive that there is a face inside colored uh, with free, all the free colors uh, present, which is a contradiction with either of these properties. Good, any more questions? Maybe some plus ones if you, if you got this argument. Yeah, the, the argument is not entirely complete, but I hope that uh, that you can see that uh, um, this should be patchable. Good. Uh, should I explain something more? Uh, because I do not see many plus ones. Okay, maybe uh, maybe because uh, and, and and I am sorry for that uh, because there are some technical details uh, here missing. Maybe we will just proceed to the uh, to the next lemma and uh, we will fix all the details uh, here during the tutorials. Good. So the the last thing that we need to check, and this is uh, this is uh, something that uh, that is the, the, this actually interesting here, um, is uh, we need to prove that uh, if the flows between uh, west and east is uh, is large, and the flow between north and south is is large, uh, equal to k, then I can actually find the real clean uh, k times k grid map. Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's have a flow of size k from north to south, and let's have a flow of size k from west to east, and we will just choose those flows uh, uh, nicely. Uh, by a flow, I mean a, um, a set of k disjoint paths uh, from 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 between the respective sides. I will choose the flows in such a way that the symmetric difference in terms of the number of edges is minimized. So among all the flow, all, all the pairs of flows, so uh, southwest and northeast, uh, sorry, south, nor north, south, uh, west, east, I choose a pair of flows for which the symmetric difference of the, in, in terms of the edge sets is, is minimized. And I claim that these pair of flow, this pair of flows actually gives me what I want. Uh, more precisely, I want to prove that whenever I have a column, which is a north-south uh, path, and a row, which is a east-west path, then actually the intersection of every row and every column, I claim that it is connected. And if I prove this claim, then, I, then actually I have a nice grid mine, because how this uh, must look like. Let's, uh, so here are the columns. Uh, how a row can look like. Well, it, it starts in, uh, in, in, in the west, it goes. At some point, it hits the first, uh, the first column. Then it needs to go along, with, uh, along this column uh, a little bit because of the connectedness. Yes? And once it leaves this column, it cannot go back again. Yeah? Because then if it leaves, uh, it, it cannot go back because the, the intersection must be connected. Yeah? So here I've got some connected parts. Maybe then it, it travels to the second column. Once it leaves the second column, it can't go back and so on. So the first row must look like that. Then the second row must look like similarly like that. Yeah. So the intersections with consecutive columns because of being connected, yeah, it must, they, must be, uh, they must be really connected. So if I now draw all the, all the rows, I can make the this uh, this paths being the intersections into branches of my uh, of my grid minor. 
Yes. And now connect them uh, using the remainder of the of the paths from P and from Q into a click mine, in, into a grid mine. Yeah. So you see that if I prove this claim, then I have a nice clean uh, grid miner uh, construct. Good. Uh, so, so now what do we, this is what we want to prove. Uh, so let's first look at the last column. Yeah, so the last north-south uh, path. So this is this green path. Here. And let's look at any row. So this is this path Q. This is a north, uh, sorry, uh, west-east path. Um, good. So now if I look at the intersection, uh, the, the, the various intersections of these two paths, we have, I mean, these are intervals on both of those paths, yes? And they're interleaved with uh, something I would call excursions, yes? So whenever I, I have the, this intersection, maybe at some point uh, the, the, the red one, uh, the red path leaves the, 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 the blue path and it goes to the right and then it, it joins back with the red one, proceeds a little bit further and then maybe it goes into an excursion to the left and so on. Um, good. So, uh, so I have left excursion and right excursion. The left excursion are excursions to the left of the, uh, to the, to the west of the, of the left column and excursions to the right are excursions to the right. So first of all, I claim that there are no right excursion by our minimality assumption. Why? If I had a right excursion like this on the picture, then I can uh, make the flow better by replacing part of the path P of the column P. Why? Because instead of going here in a straight, I could here use this excursion, yes, to patch a part of my, uh, uh, I could replace this part of the, um, of the path P with this excursion here, yeah? So in this way, uh, I do not. I do not intersect any other uh, column by making this replacement because all the other columns are to the left of this side, of this of the of, of this part of the picture. Yes. While uh, by doing this uh, this replacement, I made the symmetric different shrink between the two flows. Yeah. So I replaced one path in the flow P with some other path, so that uh, I get to now a pair of flows with smaller symmetric difference. And this is a contradiction because we started with a pair of flows where the symmetric difference is the smallest possible. Good. So this means that there are no right excursions. Now I claim that there are no left excursions either. So imagine now that I have a situation like that. I already know that there are no right excursions. So I only have excursions to the right. Yes. Um, and I need to arrive at the contradiction again. So let's say I have the, the first intersection point between the red path and the blue path, we uh, call it X, and the last one, call it Y. And now the crucial uh, point is that if I look at the interval on P between X and Y, so this part of the path P, yes, between X and Y, then it cannot be intersected by any other red path, by any other row. Why? Well, uh, let's imagine that the situation is like on the picture that X is above Y, uh, that's, that's the other case is symmetric. So if I have any row above like that, how could it intersect this, uh, this, um, this, uh, this interval? Well, it would need to go from the right, but then this would be a right excursion for this path. So this path cannot intersect this point. And any path from below, yes, well, this part of the, of the path Q is sort of shielding this interval between X and Y from any path from below. Again, I would need to cross this, uh, this, this red path in order to be able to, uh, to, uh, to intersect this interval X, Y. Um, and uh, this cannot happen because the red paths are pairwise disjoint. Good. So this means that the interval X, Y is completely free from the other uh, red paths. So now I can make a replacement on the red path Q. Yeah? Instead of going with through all these excursions to the right, uh, to the left, I could simply replace it with this part of the, of the blue path. Yeah? And again, in this way, 
if there are any excursions to the left, I made the symmetric difference between the two flows actually shrink because I now use only uh, uh, parts that are in common. Good, so this means that there are no left excursions and there are no right excursions. And if there are no left excursions and there are no right excursions, then the last column, because uh, everything that we did so far was the, for the last column, the intersection of any row must look like that that I, I uh, get here. Without any excursion, I follow a little bit with the, with the blue path and then I leave it and never, uh, never meet again. Good, so now the last column is good. Yes, we know that all the rows, they look like that. Yeah, the intersections are, uh, are connected. Uh, so now we can apply the same reasoning for the, for the pre-last column. If I now look at the pre-last column, yes, then uh, actually I can now forget about all this part of the picture because uh, I already do not have the left excursion from the last column, so they, these paths cannot go back. So I can think of this as simply the end of, of, those, of those rows, and I can apply the same reasoning for the pre-last column to say that the pre-last column is also good. Yeah? Good meaning that intersections with all rows are connected. And so on and so on, I apply the reasoning and infer in this way that all the columns are good. So every row intersection of a row and the column is, uh, is connected. Good, so this was the, the argument for cleaning the, uh, the grid. Uh, just to recap, the main idea was to uh, choose the flows so that the symmetric dif their symmetric difference is minimized in terms of cardinality and argue that then uh, the flows actually must uh, form a nice uh, clean grid. Good, any questions about this argument or some plus ones if, uh, if you're happy with it? Okay, I see a few plus one, but only a few. Uh, any doubts that I should uh, explain again? Could you repeat why cannot we just cross? Uh, like in this picture, the uh, second to last column, we just cross the uh, red edge and or the red path and the blue path with only one vertex in the intersection, or is it counted as a connected intersection? Yeah, it counts as a connected intersection. It could be that a uh, path will go, looks like that. Yeah, okay. this is a connection, connected intersection consisting of one vertex, and it's completely fine. Any further questions? Okay, if not, then um, then maybe we will continue. Uh, so this is the end of the proof of the of the exclusive grid minor uh, theorem for planar graphs. Uh, I swept some uh, technical details under the carpet in the flow cut duality. I hope that uh, we will be able to uh, to fix them uh, during the tutorials. Uh, it will like, be actually a good uh, exercise, I guess. Uh, good. So let's derive a few corollaries that are important uh, for, uh, for the understanding of planar graphs. And so the first uh, corollary is that planar graphs have a small, uh, um, uh, small uh, truth. Yeah? So I claim that the, the truth of a planar graph is bounded by, uh, by order of square root n. And the proof is really simple. Well, because if the truth was larger than this nine over two times square root of n plus one, then actually I would get a square root n of n plus one times square root of n plus one grid as a minor. And if I have such a large grid and then I actually have n plus one vertices at least in my graph. So this means that the, ver the, the graph should have more vertices than it has uh, a contradiction. Yeah, so just from the grid minor theorem, uh, I can uh, derive the existence of, uh, of a three decomposition of with square root n. And this is tight because of the grid. Uh, so in particular, if you now remember, if I have a graph of true with k, then it has a balanced separator of size uh, at most k plus one. Yeah, uh, this was uh, taking the central back of a three decomposition, uh, gives you a set of vertices so that if you delete this, uh, uh, the set of vertices from the graph, every connected component that you get has at most half of the value. 
this is one of the lemmas that uh, was used in the approximation algorithm for true. Yeah. So by just applying this for this uh, true if uh, uh, square root n, I guess that every planar graph has a ver such as a vertex of size square root n, where e such that every connected component after removing it uh, shrinks significantly, uh, shrinks by the, but more at least half. Uh, good. So this is a balance separator theorem for planar graphs, and there is like a bazillion of different uh, balance separator theorems for, for planar graphs. Um, because now from the proof that we did, you can actually derive that uh, the separators that you get, uh, they are not just some subsets of vertices. Uh, the, um, in our proof, actually, the separators we used were nooses, right? So you should be able to... Uh, uh, to kick this uh, uh, our proof to get something more um, a better topological understanding of the subset uh, x, and what you can actually prove is that whenever you have a plane graph G, I can find a noose that travels through at most square root and vertices, and both the inside and the outside has at most two thirds of the vertices of the whole graph. Yeah, so it is a balanced noose lemma now. So you can always find a short separator in a planar graph that respects the planar embedding in the sense that it is a noose. Uh, this does not uh, follow directly from the proof that we did uh, because of this caveat with the uh, with uh, the uh, the north south uh, um, phase vertex curve touching uh, west and east. Uh, the problem is that uh, in such a situation one big uh, uh, graph can suddenly get uh, dissolved into, into many uh, smaller graphs, uh, and then you do not have this, this balanceness uh, easily derivable. Uh, however, you can kick the proof uh, in order to get a tree decomposition that has binary branching, and then uh, from this statement, you can derive uh, this kind of a balanceness. Level. Yeah, I just wanted to state it for the record. Good, so uh, let me just uh, say a few uh, last words about uh, how all of this works on, on surfaces uh, instead of uh, planar graphs. So planar graphs are the same as uh, graphs embedded in, uh, embeddable in a sphere, uh, but then you can think about toroidal graphs, so graphs embed embeddable on the torus. Yes, or graphs embeddable in more complicated surfaces, uh, like a double torus on a projective plane and so on. And uh, this kind of lifts uh, were important in the, uh, in the proof of the graph miners theorem. And uh, therefore many of the tools that we now uh, have seen uh, do uh, lift this way. So the fact number one that we have proved today, the tree with uh, radius ratio lifts uh, to uh, surface embeddable graphs uh, without problems. Uh, so if I have a graph embedded in a surface uh, sigma, then the true if of G is bound linearly in the radius, where the, um, the constant in, the, in, the, uh, in this uh, linear function uh, is, is linear in the genus of, 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 of the signal. Yeah, so the, the more handles you get in, in say, uh, an orientable surface, uh, the worse uh, true if radius bound you have, but still, this is, this is a linear bound. So this is good to know. And actually, this fact is not that hard. I think we will be able to prove it during the tutorials next week. A uh, harder fact to prove is that the grid minor theorem uh, also lifts uh, with the linear bound. Namely, if you, have a, um, if you have a graph G embedded in a surface sigma, uh, whose truth is large, larger than some constant depending on, on sigma times k, then you are certain that there is a k times k grid minor. So again, in surface embedded uh, uh, graphs, uh, you have a linear uh, excluded grid minor theorem. And the constant actually depends, I think, linear on the genus. Uh, so yeah, so this was uh, about graphs embedded in a surface. Uh, then you can ask, uh, OK, we have already seen uh, further uh, um, generalizations of uh, surface embedded graphs, namely graphs that uh, exclude some fixed graph H as a minor. Yeah, so what about H minor free graphs? Uh, we probably, Martin, uh, told you about the, um, the, 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 the structure theorem uh, from uh, graph minor 16 uh, for, uh, for um, H minor free graphs. Uh, and this theorem sort of tells you that uh, any H minor free graphs can be obtained from uh, surface embedded graphs by, uh, by some uh, tree-like operation. 
Uh, so fact number one fails. Actually, in the full generality of H minor free graphs, you do not have a functional relation between uh, between the grid minor, between the uh, radius and the truth. And the uh, example is very simple. Imagine that you take a grid, yeah, a large grid, and you add a universal vertex. You add a vertex that is, um, that is adjacent to everybody. So this graph is K6 minor free. Why? Because adding a universal vertex can uh, bump the, the, the size of a click minor that you can find only by one, because only one uh, branch from, the, uh, from a click minor can use this vertex. And uh, the grid itself, well, it's planar, so it's K5 minor free. Okay. So this graph is K6 minor free. However, the neighborhood of this vertex, that's radius one, yes, sees all of this grid. And this grid has unbounded truth. So you see here a vertex, a graph of radius one, whose truth is unbounded. So this means that the truth radius uh, bound will not hold for general H minor free graphs. However, fact number two, the excluded uh, grid minor theorem for planar graphs uh, is uh, liftable to H minor free graphs. So whenever you've got uh, a fixed graph H, you can find the constant CH such that whenever you've got a graph that is H minor three, whose truth is larger than CH times K, then you are certain that there is a K times K grid minor. Yeah, so in H minor three graphs, you've got the excluded grid minor theorem with a linear bound. Um, good, and the proof of this, uh, probably there are multiple proofs, but uh, uh, you can do it using the structure theorem for H minor three graphs. So you can prove it uh, in the bounded genus case first, and then understanding that H minor free graphs are sort of uh, um, messy uh, surface embedded graphs, uh, derive it for H minor free graphs. Good. So this is uh, everything I wanted to uh, say for today. I am very sorry for this uh, technical details in the, in the uh, flow cut duality. Uh, I hope that we'll be able to fix it, and I hope that we'll be able to fix this nice proof using Sperner's lemma, because using Sperner's lemma is always nice in, in the case of topological graphs. Are there any questions uh, at this point? Okay. If there are no questions, uh, I stop the recording now.